And we now will go to the next component of this extraordinary morning with our chair in medicine, Dr. Moro O. Salafu. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamholz, Dr. Friedman. We now call the memorial service to order, and I request you to take one minute of silence before we begin. Thank you very much. Uh, the second thing we need to do is we want to recognize the Dimitis family who are here with us today. Could you stand up and be recognized? I would also like to thank all the people who knew Dr. Cam Halls, who worked with him closely, uh, who actually mentored him, including Dr. Cam Halls, uh, Dr. Burke, uh, Dr. Bradley, um, Dr. Peter Smith. Uh, they actually worked very closely with Dr. Demetis. I'd like to thank you for coming. I would also like to thank the department for coming to celebrate the life of Dr. Demetis. He was an incredible man. I am going to control my emotions right now because if I don't, you cannot speak. So I'll try to control what I have so that you'll be able to speak uh, when the time comes. But he was really an incredible man. And life, as we celebrate it, uh, comes along with death, and we have to celebrate death as well because it's imminent and it's just part of life and part of the way uh, we are structured as human beings. So we are not going to mourn. We are going to look at the positive things that Dr. Demetrius has done in this world. We are going to celebrate his life. We are going to remember all the good things, all the good impacts he has had for SUNY Downstate, for his family, uh, and for the Brooklyn, Brooklyn community at large. And I understand he did very good service to the Greek community at Bay Ridge. And I'm sure they are also very proud of his, uh, of his life as well. Um, he was born on September 17, 1956 and he passed on August 14, 2015, at the age of 58. Too soon to go, but I know all of us will always remember him for the things, for the good things that the speakers who are coming to the podium will tell you about. We will never forget about Dr. Demetis. We will always remember him. We will always have him at our hearts, and we know that he was one good person that the Lord sent to us, and he did what he had to do, and he returned in goodwill. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Foronji, who is going to be stepping in as Division Chief. Uh, actually, he has already stepped in as Division Chief of the Primary and Critical Care Division. Uh, he came to us from the Mount Sinai Healthcare System. He's Associate Professor of Medicine. He brings to us incredible knowledge. He is beginning to rebuild the division, and I would like to give him uh, the chance to say a few words before we continue. I just want to say, especially looking at his family, you realize what a father figure he was, but not only to you, but to the downstate community. And it's no exaggeration to say he's the father of pulmonary and critical care medicine here. And although this is a memorial service, he doesn't belong in the past. Now more than ever, he belongs to the future. Because whenever anyone experiences great care, they'll feel his presence. Whenever any family is consoled, they'll feel his presence. And whenever any house staff officer or colleague is truly inspired, they'll feel his presence. And in that most important way, he's gonna live on here at Downstate forever. Along those lines, we have decided to uh, memorialize his life with three different awards. Uh, and the first one is the House Staff Award. The House Staff Award, which is going to be called the Spiro Demetis Award in Critical Thinking, exemplifies who Dr. Demetis was. He was the doctor for the doctors. If you had a problem and you wanted to know why this problem is happening, or why this patient has this particular you know, patient condition, Dr. Demetrius was the person to explain it to you and find the mechanism to make the patient better. So we will be having this house staff award at the end of the year. It's going to be presented 
at the annual house staff um, reception um, by the GME program headed by Dr. Stephen Wise. The second fund is going to be an endowment fund in the name of Dr. Demetis. It is going to be called the Spiro Demetis Memorial Fund. Uh, this fund is going to be endowed by the family. We are still working the details out. Uh, but the fund will be used for various things that Dr. Demetis paid attention to and was passionate about. He wanted to do research. He wanted to do clinical trials. He wanted to do a lot of things that he couldn't do in his 58 years of life. But we will keep that moving and that legacy uh, with this fund. We also would memorialize him in the ICU by dedicating a plaque. The plaque was approved this week by the Medical Executive Committee of the uh, institution of the hospital. The plaque is going to be in the ICU. And this would also uh, be a testimony to the fact that we deeply appreciate all the services. In fact, Dr. Demetri slept in the ICU. He spent more time at Downstead than he spent at home. That is true. And so we want to make that clear in this plaque that he contributed so much to this institution. And in fact, for 11 years, he was the only one holding the division together, the pieces together, for 11 years until he passed. So we deeply appreciate that, and we appreciate the family as well. We would then call Reverend Sharon E. Cardinal Walker to come up to the podium and provide some words of counsel. Good morning. I greet you in peace this morning. Let me begin by saying that our journey together began almost 10 years ago. Dr. Demetis stood with me at the bedside of an aged and dying woman, taking full responsibility for her as she had outlived all of her relatives. He shared that her faith in God was strong and that she had, he had promised her when her time of death was at hand, he would put everything in place, including honoring the rituals of her faith. Standing together at bedside and maintaining reverence with his head bowed Throughout most of the readings, most of the sacred chants and her anointing was absolutely incredible. His voice lifted only to repeat the words, so be it. This great man treated the patient who had a disease and not the disease only. His care of this patient did not end with the correct diagnosis, but instead he inexhaustibly walked with her. Knowing he couldn't make her well, he comforted her with his unconfined heart and the perceptive use of his eyes, his ears, and his hands. For Dr. Demetis, this was not only an occasion, but hallmarked his care and our experiences together from that encounter and on. With his departure from this earth, some of us are left pained. Some of us are feeling lost and devastated even riddled with questions, the biggest one being why. Dr. Demetis asked why as well. In fact, his question specifically was, Reverend, is this all there is? While asking that question though, he readily held to his faith, a faith that told him that God was in contact with him in the midst of this journey. Sacred text informed and reminded him that God was with him that God's ways were not his ways and God's thoughts not his thoughts. Like Dr. Demetis, we don't always understand God's means or methods or for that matter, God's timing. God has purposes to which we are not privy. God allows winds to blow and storms to rage, sorrows and tears to befall us and our ways may wend through darkness and even difficulty. The sacred text that Dr. Demetis held in his heart and shared evidence by understanding was that God was right there with him. There is a wonderful writer by the name of Tozer who wrote, to the child of God, there is no such thing as an accident or a premature death. He travels an appointed way. Accidents and sickness may appear to befall him and misfortunes may stalk his way. But these will be so in appearance only and will only seem as unfair because we cannot read the secret script of God's hidden influence and so cannot discover the ends at which God aims. The man of faith, as was Dr. Demetrius, lived in the absolute assurance that his steps were ordered by God. 
He knew he could not be torn from this earth one hour ahead of the time which God had appointed, and he could not be detained on earth one moment after God's work through him was complete. It is natural and normal, however, for those of us left to ask why. Why at his age? Why this man? Though we may not always get answers to our why questions, he always says, God does listen, doesn't he? Knowing that the call and the final call was at hand, Dr. Demeter simply acts at each of us, beginning with his beautiful wife, Tina. Each of us and his exceptional children take heart and live the best lives we know how. Live with ambition, live with devotion to call. Live with purpose, with faith and integrity. Be loyal, be full of pride and truth. Play, laugh, uphold precious loyalties. To us, as a professed son of God, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, who I believe in, will give to me on that day. May your hearts be comforted. Amen. And I call upon Samantina Dimitis to come to the podium and give us some words of comfort. Describing our father's impact on our lives in a few words presents quite a challenge. Everyone here today has had the opportunity at one time or another to know Dr. Spiro Demetis as a mentor, teacher, colleague, and friend. But my siblings and I had the privilege of knowing him as our father. He made it a point throughout our lives to always be present despite the demands of his patients and medical practice whether it was cheering or screaming at us from the sidelines of our athletic events, participating at our various Greek community functions, or helping us with our studies. I can recall a time when I was in junior high school and my father had attended one of my swimming meets. As I was anxiously waiting for the meet to begin, I happened to dive ahead of the sound of the gun into a belly flop. Of course, with the utmost sympathy, my father started to hysterically laugh and say, nice belly flop, pork. In our most difficult or embarrassing moments, our father always found a way to comfort us with his good-natured sense of humor. He had a zest for life, as evidenced by his love for music, culture, travel, and dance. Some of our fondest, our fondest memories of him are on the dance floor with my mother showing off their salsa moves or grabbing the microphone at events to sing one of his favorite Greek songs. As an immigrant in this country, he took great pride in his Greek heritage but also had a deep respect and curiosity for other cultures. His love of Hellenism has influenced our appreciation and participation in our afternoon Greek school, as well as great family memories during our travels to Greece. Our father also instilled in us a great sense of responsibility for our work. He was passionate about his life's calling, which was exemplified through his seemingly boundless energy, drive, work ethic, and the compassion he had for his patients. He would repeatedly impress upon us that regardless of the career we choose, we should pursue it with zeal, vigor, and meaning. As many of you have experienced firsthand, there was a certain aura surrounding my father that drew people to him. He had the uncanny knack to make everyone feel comfortable and relaxed. He had the ability to relate to people regardless of age, gender, or ethnicity. At one moment, you would find him playing football with my brother and his friends, and in the next, he'd be playing backgammon with someone 30 years his senior while discussing politics. We would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to present to you a small glimpse of what our father has meant to us. He leaves behind a tremendous legacy with the way he has touched our lives and the lives of people who have crossed paths with him. Although he is no longer with us, he is alive in our hearts, and we will preserve his memory and continue his legacy throughout our own actions in life. Thank you. We have a short video uh, to show you about the life of Dr. Demetis.
Thank you very much to friends and family who contributed to the pictures. Uh, and thank you, Shelley, for putting this together very nicely. Uh, lovely. Thank you. OK, so we now move on to the professional colleagues who knew him very well. I would like to invite them to uh, make some remarks. And I will first start by inviting Dr. Mahoney uh, to the podium. Good morning. Now, <laughs> absolute pleasure being here. And um, before I start, I'd like to explain how I became Dr. Demetrius's, we'll say beach. <laughs> Three years ago, I'm on rounds with one of our fellows. And she says, Dr. Mahoney, I know what you are. Uh, this is a wonderful moment for me. I thought back about how all the attendings before me at the Camelots, Dr. Hill, who's still here, Dr. Smith, my first attending here, had a proud moment this was. She was going to say something like, oh, Dr. Mahoney, you're the greatest. We love working with you. The fellas love working with you. You never take the Broncos to a film. You never yell at us. You're always in the teaching mode. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with you. It's a pleasure in the bronchoscopy room. You never yell at us. So I I usually walk a little bent over. She said that. I stood tall. She said, you're a Dr. Demetrius' bitch. <laughs> so I, I tried to figure out how she could come to this conclusion. <laughs> so I thought about, now, Spill was 58 years old. Spill did not get cheated. Spill was all over the world, everywhere. And Spill, when he would go to these places, he could be in, as you see in the pictures, he could be fishing in Florida off the Keys. He could be in Greece. He could be in Puerto Rico. In fact, out of the first sight, Puerto Rico was very interesting because he would call me from Puerto Rico and say, uh, Charlie, there's a rainstorm here. I'm in the airport. I can't get out. It's just impossible. Meanwhile, the fellows would pull up in 80, 83 degrees, <laughs> no threat of rain. Or, out of the next slide, or he could be home in Greece. Charlie, it's a snowstorm. I can't get out. I need you to cover me. 46 degrees, 0% zero, zero chance of precipitation. You got to work for me. The next night, I, I can't work. Can you work for me? But Dr. Demetrius was, a, a, he was fair. He just didn't enjoy life himself. He even let his, his, favorite, his favorite beach Mahoney have a little fun. So when it was time for me to go, well, he would let me go. One year I went skiing. I came back on crutches. <laughs> God damn it, Mahoney, didn't I tell you no, no black people would be skiing? <laughs> How many black <laughs> How many black people do you see out there skiing? <laughs> I said, 17. <laughs> Not your goddamn family. How, about, how many other people are out there? So I had to pull up a slide. This is not the Mahoney household skin. So I had to pull up a slide to show Spill that yes, uh, there are other, a couple of other black people who, uh, who do ski. <laughs> My time is short. It's been an absolute honor uh, to work on the Spill. It's been a pleasure. And not only work on the Spill, but all the attendants here before Spill. Um, reminder that just, ever since I was an intern, he was two years above me. God damn it, Mahoney, I want my slides at 2 a.m. Because, of course, we had to do our own peripheral smears, our own slides, our own everything. Our own Graham says, God damn it, Charlie, how long did you look at that slide? You had to look 29 minutes at the slide for AFB to say it was negative. Um, through our fellowship, he would take me to the prison ward. We'd bonk cases in the prison ward. Through, uh, through being attending, a, a junior attendant, he brought me into the service. Mind you, the last thing I like to say, at the bedside uh, here in July, when it wasn't doing well, I told Tina there was something that, uh, you know, that I wanted to do for him, but uh, he refused. And she said, God damn it, Charlie, why are you listening to him? <laughs> Thought I was talking to Spill with that God damn it, Charlie. <laughs> so, I just, there, there were two answers that immediately came to, to mind. One, the first one I told her, I said, because he still spilled Demetrius. 
And the second answer, as I, walk, as I walked away from Tina that day, and as I walk away from you now, I'm still spilled to me this is bitch. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Very nice, Dr. Mahoney. Thank you very much for those uh, inspiring uh, uh, <laughs> uh, pictures. Um, Dr. Hill, Dr. Ross Hill. Dr. Hill is our program director for the fellowship program. Good morning. <laughs> Greetings to my colleagues and to the Demetis family. This morning, we're celebrating the life and achievements of a truly remarkable man who, for more than a quarter of a century, it was really a large presence in the Department of Medicine, particularly the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. And that simple word, large, applied to Spiro in a number of ways. The scope of his busy career in medicine, his indefatigable capacity to work, the energy he brought to all of his endeavors, and yes, his capacity to enjoy life, as you've seen this morning, uh, whether it fam with family or friends, or in the workplace, as many of us have seen and enjoyed ourselves, and I think the photos give you a good sense of the magnitude of Spiro Demetis' spirit. When it came to Spiro's experience as a clinician, large was some understatement. Uh, it dawned on me that there are probably very few, if any, clinicians in North America who have cared for a greater number of critically ill patients. Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I first got to know Spiro during his fellowship, and as you may know, he often burned the candle at both ends. And he chose to do his moonlighting in the uh, critical care area of the emergency department at Kings County Hospital, not at some quiet white uh, night watch job, as he might have done. And thus began a career that in good part was dedicated uh, to the care of the most acute and complex and challenging clinical problems in a setting where the stakes are often quite high. Spiro saw the world around him realistically and without illusions. This clear-sightedness, together with his keen intellect and his decisiveness, I think was key to his clinical acumen. Uh, it also helped make him an astute leader for our division and others, an effective teacher, a savvy businessman, to mention some of the roles that he filled successfully during his life. One of the traits we could admire about Spiro was his directness, and that has certainly come across in the slides. Um, his views were strongly held, and he certainly was not shy about expressing them. But this forthrightness, uh, coupled with really his essential honesty, engendered trust in everyone who interacted with him, whether it was colleagues, his trainees, and I'm sure his patients. Spiro generally conducted himself in a no-nonsense manner when he was going about his business in the clinical arena. Um, he really had not much patience for vacillation or for bullshit, as you've seen and he was no one's fool. But that tough facade belied an underlying compassion and I think a seasoned uh, insight into the circumstances of other people's lives. And that brought out a softer side when somebody was in a predicament uh, and could use his support. And I've seen on, on numerous occasions his capacity to be sympathetic and supportive for our fellows uh, when they were dealing with some distressing situation, whatever it might have been. This brings us to another admirable trait, and that's Spiro's loyalty to those in his daily sphere. The role of pater familias, family, uh, f father of the family, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to attempt this in Greek, um, but came naturally to him, and this is a position that he really held in several domains in his professional life, and not just at home with his, his actual family. For the many fellows who trained under him, and I've counted about 100 or so during his directorship of our division, they could rely on his strength and guidance, and that included a sharp scolding when they were off base, as a few of you might know. When Spiro Demetis raised his voice, everyone paid heed. But he was always fair-minded, he was a straight shooter, and he was there to protect uh, those who needed, them when they need, uh, those who needed uh, him when he needed help. And so in return, he received the loyalty and the respect of everybody who worked with him. The illness that took him away was cruel in its untimeliness and its rapidity. I mean, it really granted uh, he and his family, him and his family, virtually no grace period to tie up the strands of his life before he departed us. Last June, when he took me aside to give me the dreadful news of his diagnosis, he faced his prospects with unflinching realism, with courage, and really was a leading concern for others. 
This included a deep sense of responsibility to his patients. He confessed feeling guilty that he would not be there for the ones who needed his medical care the most. And of course, to his family, the base on which he stood tall. Spiro chose to receive his final care in University of Hospital, appropriately enough. This was his home away from home. And through those distressing weeks last summer, many devoted colleagues, nurses, physicians, therapists, and so forth, attended to him daily, providing a blessing and some comfort during what was otherwise a painful period. The number of colleagues and, and trainees uh, was impressive, whether current or from years back, whether residing in the metropolitan area or traveling from many states away. Um, they came to spend time with him and joining the family in their vigil during those weeks. Um, and this attests to the affection and the gratitude that all of us felt for this remarkable man. So to conclude, we remember Spiro as a masterful and tireless physician, as a loyal and compassionate colleague, as a teacher, and as a leader. But beyond that, and you've certainly seen, he was energized by a life force, and uh, he really had an earthy zest for life, and that's a word that others have, have brought to our minds this morning as well. At times reminding me of another very memorable Greek, Zorba, the Zorba of film and novel fame. Spiro was, in every important sense of the word, a man. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Uh, we now call upon uh, Dr. Bradley. Dr. Bradley uh, was a faculty member at Downstate. He was the chief of service for University Hospital of Brooklyn prior to moving to the North Shore LIG healthcare system. Thank you for coming. So uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here today to speak about my good friend Spiro Demetis. Um, I know him uh, for a long, long time, actually, uh, from our first year of medical school together, long before his family came along. Um, so who was Spiro Demetis to each of us? What words come to mind? To me, he's a friend, a classmate from 1978, colleagues starting internship in 1984 here at Downstate in Kings County, uh, chief resident together, and then fellowship at the same time together as well, and then joining the faculty. To others, he was a teacher, a mentor, a supervisor, and certainly a taskmaster. Okay? To patients, he was a true advocate for better health and for better outcomes. He was a defender, a provider, and a demander for quality health care and quality outcomes. He was a teacher to the next generation of doctors, and as Ross Hill mentioned, so many of his former trainees came to see him during these last few months uh, out of respect to what he meant to them. He was a holder of high standards. What you may not know about him is that we fished in the Florida Keys a lot, and he was a pretty lousy fisherman despite those pictures. <laughs> he was even a worse golfer. At a charity event, he showed up with his huge uh, bag of golf clubs with the plastic still on them. <laughs> no putter, no tees, no golf balls. Um, <clears throat> he was a great friend, and he was a different person from what you may know him at work here at this institution. When I came here to visit him during his final weeks, um, I noticed how much this place didn't change. But then again, how much it has changed, and it's changed greatly with the loss of Spiro Demetis. Despite uh, those pictures, he was an acclaimed disco dancer. He came to Brooklyn during the disco craze, and uh, I watched many times his uh, finesse on the dance floor. <laughs> okay. He was known for his generosity. Um, there were times when uh, there was no money to have a holiday party for the Department of Medicine and he found a venue and he reached over and grabbed a few of his friends, emptied pockets, and we all contributed to have a party for the house staff. I think that happened about three years in a row. Uh, he was generous um, and he was a great supporter of the Greek School of Plato and you saw some of the pictures there. Uh, every year there was an annual dinner dance and there was a um, program and Spiro would come to me and say, Bradley, you owe me $250. <laughs> what for? I put an ad in the 
Greek school of Plato's thing for you with your card, okay? Um, uh, you know, when he first came to Brooklyn, uh, he entertained us on fishing trips with hilarious stories. Uh, he was made to go to school in a suit. His father was a tailor, okay? And uh, it didn't take long for him to have his lunch money taken away from him <laughs> by someone who went on to become a professional basketball player in the NBA. Um, that was at Boys High School, now Boys and Girls High School. Um, <clears throat> that sort of made a rapid assimilation for him into U.S. culture. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there were some rules with Spiro, and many came to realize this quite quickly through experience. You don't BS him. And I can tell you from personal experience, never play poker with Spiro Demetrius. <laughs> okay. You have much to be proud of in terms of his, uh, uh, um, his role uh, in here and in life. His legacy is his family, um, both his related family and the greater family of uh, downstate medicine and, his, and the community. And for this, he has enriched um, the community and influenced so many uh, through his efforts. And um, with that, I'm gonna close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley. I now call upon the ICU nurses uh, to say a few words. Um, Annalisa, Ann Mimi, and Ms. Thom Thomas. The first encounter I had with Dr. Nemitis was the year of 1996. My fondest memories of him was being awed by his presence when he entered the room. Whenever he would speak, he would captivate everyone's attention with his flawless energy. I remembered one of the ICU attendings asked me, why is it that all the MICU nurses gravitate to him? What is it that he has that I don't have? I told him Dr. Demetrius is an amazing individual who knows how to teach at all levels. This meant teaching his physicians, his nurses, his techs, his aides, and even his clerks. He had a genuine selfless compassion to teach without hesitation despite all the stress and politics he would encounter on a daily basis. That was the type of person he was. He will always be remembered the multiple times we spent with him with his biannual dinners with the staff, and he would spend the entire dinner talking about his wife and his children and other stories when they grew up. We will always cherish them, and he was family. When the staff came to him, he always made you feel like your question was a situation that the only thing meant that he would help you solve. <clears throat> he would never pass the issue to someone else to solve it. He would say, I will handle it, and he did. He was our physician who made our entire staff feel important. In his eyes, the MICU staff was his number one, and that is why in our eyes, he will and always will be ours. Our Greek God, who took care of him in the end, and he will always be missed. Thank you. Being asked to speak is a great honor. Finding the right words to mark the passing of our dear Dr. Demetrius, AKA Big Daddy, <laughs> AKA Dr. D. Our friend and our family member's life is difficult when emotions run high. There are no words to describe our loss. Dr. D was Fearless, timeless, and a battler until the end, he never compromised. Medicine was always the thing. He was a symbolic of greatness. To all who hear my heart speak, Dr. D and I see you will always love and miss you. Thank you. I didn't. I didn't write a speech, and there's no words to express how I feel about Dr. Demetis. He was not only my boss, he was my friend, he was the ICU nurse's friends, he was our family friends. I just want to say this to let you know what a friend he was. When my sister 
was diagnosed with lymphoma three years ago. He was not her doctor, but he was the person I would consult to when I had a problem with Dr. Horror. When I had a problem at um, Sloan Catherine, I would take all the information and I would bring it to him. He didn't only help me solve them, he gave me the advice what to say, what to ask. When I had a bone marrow drive for my sister at the Anglican Church on Eastern Parkway, I was looking for my other colleagues and some came, but almost to the end there was this tall, beautiful guy who just walked in and my sister says, Janice, who is this white man? <laughs> And they say, this is Dr. D. And they all ran to him and say, oh, this is the Dr. D we always hear about. Thank you, thank you so much. And then he signed himself, he did his um, swabbing, and he said, Janice, is there anything that you need? I am here for you and your family. To this day, my nephew Nigel still asks me for him, and he can't believe it. And all my family asks for him. I was off today, but I had to come to do this. And we, the ICU is not the same with him. Not anything to offend you, Dr. F., <laughs> but it's just when he came into the room, he has the presence. He made all of us feel like we were important. He made, and most of all, he made the family and the patients feel important. He loved this community. He loved what he did, and we, we would always be endeavored to Dr. Dimitris. And the patients, even one of my patients came in last week and she said, I don't know, I just miss him so much. She said, I remember when he took that tube and he said, if you, he came, she came to his air and she said, if you won't let me intubate you today, I will intubate you tomorrow, but guess what? After you get up, you will be alive and you will thank me and then you could sue me. And I don't care. That was the doctor he was. And that's why I love him so much and I miss him so much. I always tell my residents and all the people I work with to just do the best. Do your assessment, touch, feel, look, listen, and speak to your nurses because they are always your best friend in the unit. That's what we made us feel. And I thank God for knowing him. I thank God for bringing him in our lives. He will always be remembered. He will always be missed. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Um, and I now invite uh, Dr. Iqbal to come forward, say brief words. We're running out of time, so we'll make them brief. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Another kind of occasion I wanted to come back to Brooklyn with, but um, I didn't um, write anything because I can't summarize the time that I spent with him in two minutes. And unfortunately, um, the words that have been splashed on the screen have been said to me, so I don't think it's nice for me to repeat those words. Um, Dr. Demetrius was almost like a father, and my biggest regrets would be not to see him when he was dying. Unfortunately, I've um, not got anything left to say because you guys have said everything nice about him, but I don't know if anyone knows the, the definition of alcoholic, but that's what Dr. Demetrius was. But I don't understand how he could still manage to keep a smile on his face when you woke him up before him in the morning and still answer questions and still come back in the morning at 6 and have a smile on his face and not even remember that you woke him up for a very stupid question. And I don't know how he always made an intern feel as important as a fellow 
and a fellow as important as the next door attending, and attending as, as important as the chief of medicine. He had that knack of being there for everyone. Um, I talked to him once since I graduated, and that's also regret. Maybe I should have talked to him more. And the last thing I would say is, you should follow what he always said. Same shit, different day. Thank you very much, Dr. Iqbal, for that emotional uh, connection. Uh, we have a current fellow, uh, Dr. Rosa Arancibia, who would say a few words. Thank you. Um, I met Dr. Demides first time as an intern in Lutheran ICU in his respiratory step-down unit. Um, I, this was a case that we had together. Um, it was a 68-year-old Asian lady who was admitted initially to the ICU for hypercapnic respiratory failure, extubated successfully, downgraded to, her, to his unit. Um, however, her course was complicated by a massive lower GI, ble GI bleeding. Um, at that time, as an intern, I was not able to find my senior resident. And I was trying to, I was new in the program. So I was having difficulties actually obtaining the blood um, for this patient. So I decided to call Dr. Dominguez and ask for his help. He immediately came over, um, made some phone calls, grabbed me, we went to the lab together, went to get the blood. We literally actually um, push uh, three units of PRBC, both of us pumping as much blood as we could. At that time, um, I admire him. Uh, he will, he showed me that he will never, will hesitate to work, I mean, at his level of 30 years of experience as an intensivist and an attending, um, to work as an intern. Um, and nothing will stop him to help a patient. That day, I realized that I wanted to be like him, um, to become as good as he was. Um, moving forward, um, during my first year fellowship here at Downstate, I don't know the case, a 78-year-old male with history of CKD, diabetes, PBD, homeless guy, Again, admitted for hypoxemic respiratory failure secondary to CHF exacerbation. Successfully extubated, but it was not able, I was not able to wing him off the pressures. And most likely, this was secondary to his RB failure demonstrated on his echo. I was feeling frustrated. Um, I have exhausted every resource to try to help this patient. And that evening, Dr. Dominguez was on call. He could see on my face um, that I felt frustrated and I didn't know what else to do. I had nothing else to offer this patient. Um, I told him the story and he told me, Rosa, if we could not help this patient, nobody else will. So he made some few calls. Um, it took him about two hours. He set him out for a right sided cardiac heart. Um, that evening, I realized that I should never give up, you know? Dr. Demetrius will never have give up on anyone. He will always make sure that we did everything to save the patient's life and exhaust every possible resource in order to help a patient. Um, on my behalf and I, my colleagues in the program, we always felt and we saw Dr. Demetrius as a father and he will be the first one to reprimand us whenever we made our mistakes. However, he will also be the one to be by our side when we needed help or when we were stuck in the ICU with difficult cases. No matter what time we will call him, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, we'll tell him and he will always be there for you. Um, 
now, now you see more paper from my heart. Um, I just wish one day I could be as good as him, not even close, but at least a little piece of him. He will always be remembered in our hearts. Um, and it's a great loss for all of us um, as a human being, as a fine physician. We have lost someone very, very uh, essential for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we now invite Dr. Edmund Burke. He was the chair of medicine uh, at Downstate for seven and a half years. Um, prior to that, he was the chief of medicine at the VA, uh, the Brooklyn VA Medical Center. That is when I got to know him, and since that time, he's been instrumental in our department and leading the department in a very difficult time until his retirement. Please welcome Dr. Burke. What a face of joy and hope. Even the sunrise on Mount Athos could not compete with that. I agree with, um, with Dr. Farangi that um, sunrise, yes, but no sunset. We won't allow that to happen because he will live on in our memories and those who will replace us later on. Tina, Antigone, Stamatina, Dino, it's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity. Um, Shelly Ann Anthony, I want to mention her name. She did a great job here today. Um, going back to many years before, and um, maybe Dr. Salifu was still in diapers at the time, but I was uh, ch chairman of medicine here on the ninth floor. And um, from time to time, we would have employees coming up to the ninth floor perhaps with not very good health insurance, but in need of a doctor. And we'd call around. And we'd get understandable answers, not the answers we hope, but understandable answers. Have them schedule an appointment. Refer them to the clinic. And then Joe Sheila Crandall would say to me, why not call Spiro? And Spiro would answer, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And he would. Now, we all know the attributes of a great doctor, state-of-the-art knowledge, wisdom, compassion, a good listener, calm in an emergency. And most of us would aspire to these desiderata uh, much of the time. Spiro had them. He had them all of the time. And he had them in abundance. If anyone had still any issues of doubt as to how great a doctor he it was, all we need is to reflect on the speeches we just heard up to now. He cared deeply for his patients. His respect for them was palpable. And the patients, they knew this in their hearts. There is terminology now and jargon coming into medicine, phrases like consumer, provider, client, customer. Can you imagine Spiro seeing his doctor-patient relationship in such awful terms? Well, neither, neither could I, and neither could Spiro's patients. Long did I know the amazing esteem in which he was held by his residents and his fellows and the medical students. Uh, but the number of trainees who came to pay their last respects in his final weeks was quite an experience for me. Many had come from distant parts, flown in from distant parts of the United States. An amazing acknowledgement of his contributions. I asked one of the fellows, how is it that so many are so fond of Spiro? He reminded me because it's a while since I've been around at it, he reminded me of the triple threat of the academic physician. He pointed out, however, that in Spiro's case, it was not a, th a triple threat, it was a quadruple one. 
I asked him what he meant by that. He paused, then he added, and I quote, the vastness of the affection the residents and fellows imparted to him were merely the reciprocal of the affection he had always shown to them. In other words, Spear looked out for us one and all, and we loved him in return. In later years, as, it, as has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Bradley, um, during this particular festive season, sometimes the department funds were running a little bit low, and I would be aware of the fact that the dean might be calling me to his office to know where all the money was going. But these were the occasions when Spiro came to the rescue. These were the occasions when his generosity of heart equated with his generosity of spirit. Spiro was a man of action. As you saw, he was a mover and a shaker. No mere, no mean performer on the dance floor. May not quite have danced with the same verve and equipoise as his beloved Tina, but he sure had more style and rhythm than most of the rest of us. One of my fondest memories was back in 1988. He and Dr. Tom Bradley and I went to a Yankee game, to Yankee Stadium. When we arrived, the car park was packed. We finished scouring the outer perimeter to no avail, and suddenly Spiro spotted a vacancy, a vacant lot, right up beside the entrance to the ballpark. As he accelerated in that direction, I reticently said to him, but Spiro, there is a no parking sign over that. That's probably why it's empty, said Spiro, without giving it any further thought. <laughs> he was more experienced in the ways of New York than I was. He arrived at the empty space, neatly deposited his car in the forbidden spot. He turned to the car park attendant who was running, rushing towards us with much gesticulation. And when the car park attendant arrived, uh, Spiro confidently extended the hand of friendship to the previously agitated, but now be calmed attendant, as Spiro, usher, as Spiro uttered some soothing phrases. And he turned to him then and said, within all our ear shot, I would appreciate if you could give a close eye, keep a close eye on my new car <laughs> while we're at the ball game. <laughs> yes, sir, said the attendant. <laughs> Was this charisma or hotspur? <laughs> or both? Or both? Boy, was I impressed. And even more so by the unobtrusive way that the effigy of Andrew Jackson, Jackson exchanged hands. <laughs> Spiro, was my, Spiro was my kind of guy. Spiro was our kind of guy. Finally, one of the great poets of the 20th century, the Greek poet uh, Constantine Kavafi from Alexandria, pointed out that it is not the journey it is not, it, that it is on the journey and not at the destination that the good deeds were done and the rewards were recognized. We might have hoped that the destination had not come so soon for Spiro. But what a journey, filled with adventure and wisdom, laughter and love, gallantry and grace. May this be the way that we will cherish his memory in the future, our Prince of Men. Thank you. All has been said. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will miss him dearly, uh, but we will continue to remember him in the ways that have already been expressed. We wish the family well and the memorial is now officially closed. Uh, so once again, thank you very much and to the family.